Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. John chapter 10, real familiar and loved portion of scripture we're looking at today, the Good Shepherd. John chapter 10, beginning verse 11. But I want to do it under a theme which is, I think, applicable for those of us as we see uh, changes in the dynamic of our society happening. And uh, the title of the message today is Muhammad or Jesus. Uh, it comes from the fact that for the first time in my life, I am interacting with Muslims. I've never interacted with Muslims my whole life. And now with immigration and different things that are happening, uh, especially like in the healthcare field, home health care, nursing assistants at nursing homes, and, and, and various uh, things like this we're starting to see. Uh, I've been mostly bumping into Muslim ladies, not so much men, uh, interacting with them a little bit. And um, there's interesting dynamics that are coming out of this. Uh, some of them are, uh, they're, well, of course, if they're an immigrant, they're not used to being in a, they've never even met Christians themselves, some of them. And they're not used to being in a place of religious diversity either, because in most Muslim countries, uh, uh, open expression of Christianity or Judaism is just not allowed. And maybe some very closed private expression is tolerated. So if you're wearing a cross, you know, or there's one up on the wall that <clears throat> sometimes you get a reaction from that. Um, but some are actually inquisitive and, and are curious about our faith and uh, what we believe. And um, I heard an interesting talk by a former Muslim imam uh, yesterday uh, who became a Christian from reading the Quran. It says Jesus is mentioned 23 times in the Quran and Muhammad only four. And he's called the Word of God and he's called the crea Creator and, uh, and it was through the Quran that he became a believer in Jesus as we understand him because most Muslims consider Jesus to be a prophet who lived and died, but not on a cross. Whereas we believe he's the son of God who died on the cross for the sins of the world and rose again from the dead. But uh, for many Muslims coming to America, you know, I know on one hand we could see it as a threat, but we could also see it as an opportunity to share the gospel with someone who, where they're from, could never hear the gospel because it's illegal to share the gospel with a Muslim in those countries. Now, uh, from, I have re read report after report that, that the Christian community is growing in Iran. And it's illegal to talk about Jesus in Iran. And, and people are coming to Christ through dreams and visions and actual face-to-face -face encounters with Christ himself in Iran. It's amazing the stories that are coming out of there. But in our country, here they are. Why not take an opportunity to share the gospel? And I know uh, uh, Sharon has two friends that she was a missionary with in Liberia, West Africa, and they specialized in sharing the gospel in Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone with uh, Muslims. So they're just experts. You know, he passed away, the husband now, the wife's still there. He knew the Quran inside and out in Arabic. And uh, so when they moved to Minneapolis to retire back home, uh, they said to the realtor, said, where do you want to buy a house? Well, they didn't have much money, so this helped as well. But they said, give us the neighborhood in Minneapolis that's got the most Muslims and the highest crime rate. The most Muslims, because that's who we want to read for Christ, and the highest crime rate, because that's where they could afford a house. And they said, ah, the Jordan neighborhood, <laughs> northeast Min North West Minneapolis, you could go there. And, and they have loved it. They have loved it. They are walking up and down the streets. Mrs. 
Pinky, their last name is, she, her husband died, is walking and going for walks with Muslim ladies, and they've got a lot of questions. And she's lovingly and patiently and carefully answering them. So what about Muhammad or Jesus? Who do you want to follow and why? Well, Jesus tells us today who he is, and I think gives us good reason in comparison to follow him. Number one, Jesus, the good shepherd, willingly died for the sheep. John 11, 10, 11, where he says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus sets a clear distinction of how he is different from Muhammad. Jesus is a man of peace, was a man of peace, God in human flesh, who laid down his life for the sins of the world on the cross. Muhammad was a man of war who spread his religion by the sword and forced people of Arabia and surrounding nations to either accept his religion or be put to death by the thousands. There's the contrast right there. Jesus said, I give my life for you. Muhammad says, you follow me or you die. Quite a contrast, a very plain contrast. Now Peter, he liked the fighting side. You know, if Peter might have had met Muhammad before Jesus, you know, he might have joined his team. Peter had the sword. And uh, remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the high priest sent soldiers to arrest him. What did Peter do? Pulled the sword. And uh, he's kind of a coward, though. He cut off the ear of one of the servants. And Jesus miraculously took that ear, put it on, and uh, this is what Jesus said to Peter when it came to spreading his gospel by the sword. Matthew 26, 52. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do, do you not think I could, could, could not call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12, 000, 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? That yeah, goes back to our Lenten series, right? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus expressly gave his life on the cross. He's the Lamb of God. He's the atoning sacrifice. John 1.29, John saw Jesus coming and what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the lamb was, of course, sacrificed for the sins of the people. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. What did Jesus say to his disciples when they were arguing about being the greatest? He says, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, what? As a ransom for many. You know, the thing that Jesus said about heaven is he said we will be seated at the table of heaven and that he will serve us. Now, that just doesn't seem right, does it? But you see, in that land, being a servant is the greatest privilege. It's, it's a different land than the land we live in right now. 600 years after Jesus, Muhammad came on the scene and turned Arabia and surrounding nations into a bloodbath. He tortured and killed men, and he took their beautiful wives, even little girls, to be one of his many wives. He taught, and Islam teaches to this day, that women are men's property for men's pleasure, and if a woman does not please her husband, he has the right to beat her. He forced thousands of people to join Islam or to be put to death. And the list goes on and on. Even to this day, especially in Africa, the Islamic people are killing, kidnapping, and raping all over the world. In fact, one of their teachings is, if you want to make a girl into a Muslim, you rape her. And after you rape her, she is then a Muslim. When you compare Jesus to Muhammad, who do you want to believe in? And who do you want to imitate? Jesus was kind, even to his enemies. 
He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Even while the Roman soldiers were torturing him and then nailing him to the cross, how did Jesus reply? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they were doing. And one of his chief torturers and murderers, the centurion, was the first convert, perhaps, after Jesus died. Surely this was the Son of God. And I'm sure he accepted him. The last convert before he died was a crooked, thieving robber <laughs> who said, Jesus, remember me. And, the, and then the first one after he died who confessed him was the guy who was putting him to death. Now that's quite a thing, isn't it? He gave his life for the sins of the world, and that's something to believe in. Secondly, false shepherds don't care for the sheep. False shepherds don't care for the sheep. John 10, 11 and 12 and 13. John 10, 12 and 13. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. So faith, he didn't use that crook to take that wolf and pull him away, did he? The false shepherd. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. False shepherds don't care for the sheep. Not everybody who comes in the name of God is a caring shepherd. Not everyone who comes in the name of Christ is a trustworthy overseer. Just reading this past week, the famous International House of Prayer in Missouri closed its doors. People were coming from all over the world to the International House of Prayer to pray, and it folded. Why? The sexual misconduct of the founder. Not all shepherds are good shepherds. Pastors, priests, teachers, professing Christians, all sorts of religious people from all religions have abused people, caused pain, heartache, and deep wounds. I mean, some of the bitterest people that are against the church, at least, maybe Christ too, are those who have been abused in some way by a leader of the church. Could be verbal abuse as well. Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Peter gives us a warning about how the devil would try to infiltrate the church with false teachers. And I think that's what happens, is the devil destroys the church by infiltrating it with people who are not real, and then they come and then they do all these things to give it a bad name. Let me read to you from 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, about how the devil's plan is to destroy the church through infiltration. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them swift destruction on themselves. They'll go to seminary, they'll get ordained, they'll get in the pulpit, and then they'll start sowing in false teachings. This is the devil's plan of how to destroy the church. And he's been very effective with it. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. That would be the example from Missouri. Shameful ways that bring disrepute into the church. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. Exploitation, embezzlement, things like that. A good shepherd will be like Jesus and love the people. Uh, I was just thinking of that. I was thinking of Pastor Galland as I put this. I mean, he was my internship supervisor in Thief of Falls, uh, you know, almost 40 years ago. And uh, here I got to be with him at the end of his ministry and the end of his life right here. And uh, he loved the people so much. He loved the people so much. He, he just had to be, he, and then he had two churches to go through, Shakopee and here, and he says, I just love being here. I just love these people so much. And then when we didn't have a pastor up in Cumberland, he says, oh, 
He hadn't even met the people there yet, and he already loved them. He said, if only I could walk better, if only I was stronger, I would go up there and I'd help you, and I'd help them. But my, uh, what a good example he was for me all these years. And I, I, and I haven't even begun to live up to his example of a pastor who loved the people so very, very, very much. I mean, loving a church he's never even gone to yet. Oh, I'm sure if I met him, I'd love him. He just loved God's people. False shepherds aren't like that. They don't care for the sheep. Muhammad did not love the people. He was an angry, bitter, violent man who came from a very difficult childhood that made him bitter and angry. Jesus taught us to love the brethren. Jesus taught us to love our enemies Monday, Thursday. He said, this new commandment I give you, that I, you love one another even as I've loved you. By this will all men know you're my disciples, by your love for one another. In the Middle East, Israelis and Muslims are fighting an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. All right, you send me a bomb, I'm going to send you one. You send me two, I'm going to send you four. And it just never ends. But there is a better way, and that's to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that peace of Jerusalem is the one who died there on the cross. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And we need his kingdom in our hearts, lives, homes, and in the world. Isaiah 2.4. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Don't you look forward to that day? I do. False shepherds don't care for the sheep. And then thirdly, Jesus wants all people to become a part of his flock. Jesus wants all people to become a part of his flock. John 10, 14 through 18. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. I find great passage in the comfort in this passage for several reasons. One, one from each verse. Verse 14, Jesus knows his sheep by name, and they know him. Jesus knows who you are. He knows his sheep. Verse 15, Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. Verse 16, Jesus wants the Gentiles to be a part of his kingdom. The other sheep, the non-Jews. Verse 17, Jesus will also come back to life after he dies. He knew that. In 18, Jesus went to the cross willingly. Jesus went to the cross willingly. Who do you want to serve? Muhammad or Jesus? Both Jews and Gentiles are invited to be part of the family of God. And we are being given the mandate to bring the gospel to the whole world. Even the Jewish Christians had a hard time with that. Well, yes, we know that Jesus will save the Jews if we believe in him, but not Gentiles. They just didn't get it. They don't get it. Israel doesn't get it to this day. They are meant to be a light for the world, not a separatistic thing. Those who believe in him, he gives everlasting life. And we get to enjoy the Savior's hospitality in heaven forever. He is going to serve us. No one is threatened to turn to Jesus or to be put to death. That's how Muhammad uh, converted. I mean, all of North Africa, that was all Christian when Muhammad came around and he converted them. He had a simple evangelism method. Convert or die. And he killed thousands. And those said, okay, okay. Convert or die. That was his method. Jesus doesn't threaten anybody to come to his kingdom. 
People say, no, he threatens them with hell. No, he doesn't. All people are on their way to hell because of sin. Jesus offers to save us from it. That's our path we're on. He's the one who begs us to come off that path. What a contrast to Muhammad. Islam is a religion of anger. Jewish legalism is a religion of exclusion and self-preservation. Following Jesus is a relationship with the one who heals, forgives, and loves even the vilest sinner, even his enemies. That is why John Newton, the wicked slave trader, when Jesus saved him, penned the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That is why the last words on a believer's heart, the last song I've seen it many times, Mark, you've seen it, one of the last things that a believer sings before they die is what? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And what are, our, what are some of the last words on a believer's lips before they die? I've seen it a number of times. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why choose Jesus over, over Muhammad? Why choose Jesus over Muhammad? Well, I've told you about the Muslim executioner. He said, I was chopping off the heads, remember it? The, those orange Christians there in their orange suits and they were getting their heads chopped off. Well, this was one of the executioners. He said, I was chopping their head off and they died in peace and they had peace in their heart. He said, I didn't have peace in my heart. I knew I couldn't die. I'd die kicking and screaming and fighting. And he said, I wanted to be able to die like that. So he became a follower and a believer in Jesus Christ too. I'd like to close just on a positive note, not making any comparison with anybody or anything else, but I'd like to read you a little reading that I just heard the other day. You've probably heard it before in your life. It's been around. This is why I follow Jesus and nobody else. It's called the greatest man in history, Jesus. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He did not live in a castle, yet they called him Lord. He ruled no nations, yet they called him king. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.